This program is brought to you by Stanford on iTunes U at Stanford University. Please visit us at itunes.stanford.edu. So tonight I'm going to tell you about basically heartburn, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease, why you might get it, how we diagnose it, uh, things to think about in the differential diagnosis when patients come in with burning in their chest or chest pain, and how we treat it. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to focus on Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition associated with heartburn, and again, how you diagnose that and manage that, and the associated cancer risk with this condition. Now, heartburn is defined as typical symptoms of burning and acid regurgitation in the chest. And we call it gastroesophageal reflux disease if a patient comes in and has repeated episodes of this. And patients that have this can have a variety of complications. The first is esophagitis, which is essentially erosions that we see in the esophagus when we look down with a the camera. These can actually lead to stricturing, which are narrowing in the esophagus and bleeding, so you can actually come in with blood in the stool or throwing up blood. And then in some cases, and it's only about 10% of patients that have heartburn can get precancerous conditions that can lead to esophageal cancer. Now, since Prilosec or Omeprazole is over the counter now, you can buy it in Walgreens or you can buy it in the supermarket, most patients who come in these days do not have any erosions in their esophagus. So when I do an endoscopy, most of the time it's normal. We call that non-erosive reflux disease. But even if you don't have erosions, there have been many studies showing that your quality of life can be impaired from this. It's a chronic condition. And there are a subset of patients who have manifestations outside the esophagus. They can come in with cough or hoarseness or asthma that doesn't improve or even things like dental erosion. So there's a whole spectrum of diseases that can be linked to heartburn. Now, how common is heartburn? Well, based on surveys, if you ask Americans, 7% were reported on a daily basis, 14% once a week, and about 40% on a monthly basis. And these figures were based on a Gallup poll in 1988. Now that Americans are unfortunately getting heavier and the obesity epidemic is increasing, I bet you these, these figures will probably be, be increasing. This slide just shows you that heartburn symptoms are very common in the population. And in general, they're just as frequent in the, in the younger patients, ages 20 to 30, as they are in, in older patients. And now that we're actually looking into pediatric patients and children, we also find that uh, quite a few patients, uh, the children report reflux. And also since children are, are becoming heavier, it's also becoming an increasing problem. So as I just mentioned, uh, obesity is a risk factor for heartburn. I'll be telling you a little bit more about that. It's also been linked to Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. Advancing age is thought to be a risk factor for heartburn, uh, possibly slightly more common in men. And there are different lifestyle factors that relax the sphincter muscle between the esophagus and the stomach that may lead to heartburn, such as smoking and drinking, certain drugs. And I'll be talking to you more about these other factors like caffeine and chocolate and whether we think they really are related to heartburn or not. So why do people get heartburn? Well, the most common reason is that the sphincter muscle, called the lower esophageal sphincter, relaxes more than it should. And we don't really know why this happens, although there are potentially in patients who are overweight, there are hormonal factors that cause this to relax. So in most patients, if you study the sphincter muscle, the, the pressure may be normal, but it is relaxing too often. There's other factors, such as if you have a hiatal hernia, which is a pouch in between the esophagus and the stomach, this pouch can trap acids coming up from the stomach, and that can lead to heartburn. You can also have situations where your stomach doesn't empty normally. And for example, if you eat a very fatty meal, fat will delay your stomach from emptying, and that could lead to more heartburn. Uh, 
for example, in other patients, let's say patients who have diabetes and have problems with their stomach emptying, they will have more acid coming up because of that problem. And then in some patients also there can be material from the small intestine called bile, which also comes up into the esophagus. Um, in addition, there's some patients who have problems with their muscles, so their muscles are not working very well, and that can also lead to more heartburn. So how do patients come in with heartburn? Well, the typical symptoms are burning behind the chest, a, a sensation of something bitter coming into your throat called acid regurgitation. Most commonly it happens after eating or when you're lying down at night. And, and obviously eating late night meals is, is probably not a good idea. Some patients come in with dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, which can be due to acid coming up, impairing the muscle function, and then in some cases the muscle function can be impaired. Uh, odynophagia refers to essentially painful swallowing, which could be due to ulcers in the esophagus. We also worry about infections in that case as well. And then there's some people that just have frequent belching, which may be due to that sphincter muscle, which is relaxing too often. And it's also possible just to come in with pain in the stomach area, the upper stomach, which can be heartburn that's just not manifesting as pain in the chest. So the atypical manifestations are chest pain. So if you have a patient who has chest pain, you might want to make sure they're not having a heart attack or some kind of other heart problems. Uh, heart, heartburn can actually cause chest pain that can mimic a heart attack. And in terms of pulmonary uh, manifestations, patients come in with coughing, asthma that is suddenly not able to be controlled or new asthma, um, sleep apnea which is a problem where you're waking up at night, and pulmonary fibrosis which is actually scarring of the lungs. We are actually now aggressively screening patients that come in to the Stanford pulmonary clinic with different problems for reflux because we think there may be a relationship between the two. Other manifestations may incur something called globus, which is a sensation of something stuck in the top of your throat, uh, hoarseness, and, and potentially laryngitis and, and laryngeal cancer. Now, one thing that we've seen more research on in the recent years is whether heartburn is related to poor sleeping. And there's been studies in the population showing that if you ask patients who have heartburn, uh, a quite significant percentage of them, about two-thirds, will actually report heartburn at night, either before they go to sleep or that's waking them up from sleep. And this impacts a lot of these patients in their ability to, to work the next day. This is a recent study that was just presented at our national meeting, actually looking at differences between normal and disturbed sleepers who were in a, in a study lab. And you can see that the patients who had disturbed sleep had much higher acid contact time in the esophagus compared to the patients who had normal sleepers. So I think this is definitely a, a, a thing that we ask our patients about now is how well they're sleeping and try to figure out if that's, if that's related. This is a, a poster from the movie Super Size Me, which I, I recommend seeing. Had a profound impact on my children who now will no longer eat french fries. But uh, I think it very nicely showed uh, um, the impact of, of fast food on, on this obesity epidemic. And as I mentioned, um, there's now many, many adults in this, in this country who are overweight and so currently about 65% of adults are actually in the overweight range as defined by body mass index. And previous studies have shown a relationship between obesity and reflux so that if you have a very high body mass index, your risk of getting reflux disease is increased and actually more so in women than in men. So just this past year, uh, they took data from the Nurses' Health Study, which is a very large study performed out of Boston, and asked nurses about their, their weight and whether they were gaining or losing weight. So they mailed out different uh, questionnaires. And what they found is as the weight increased, so a normal body mass index is essentially in this range, as the nurse's weight increased, you can see that the risk of getting heartburn increased and kind of in a, in a dose-dependent manner as, as the weight increased. So this study very nicely showed that for each increment of body mass index that changed, the risk of heartburn also changed. And as you can see here, people who lost weight, so this is a weight loss of about 15 to 20 pounds, their risk of heartburn actually decreased, whereas patients who gained that amount of weight actually had an increasing risk for heartburn. So what I tell my patients now is if they can, if they're overweight and they can lose anywhere between 15 and 20 pounds, that'll probably have an impact on their heartburn symptoms. 
Now, if any of you have been diagnosed with heartburn, your doctor probably tells you to avoid certain things. Uh, they probably tell you to avoid fatty meals, don't eat spicy foods, don't eat caffeine, don't have chocolate, stop smoking, elevate the head of your bed, and, and so on. And a lot of patients come in to see me very miserable because they feel like they can't eat anything and they're still not getting better. So I finally did a study because I just wanted to see if this is true or not and looked at the evidence. And this, this actually uh, was in a lot of newspapers. And what we did is we actually compiled all the evidence we could find to try to figure out if, if these lifestyle changes actually work. And this is the first table from our paper. So what we looked at was whether there was evidence um, that sphincter pressure changed, that's that muscle between the esophagus and the stomach, whether the pH changed, and whether there's a change in symptoms. So you can see, for example, that in people with smoke, smoking, active smoking, there was some evidence that the sphincter pressure would lower and that the symptoms might be, become worse. Uh, alcohol, the, the same was essentially true. Chocolate also was, was shown to lower sphincter pressure and worsen pH. And similarly, lying on your right side when you sleep was also associated with that. So there was some evidence from these studies where they put catheters in patients that some of these agents may be changing the sphincter pressure or worsening symptoms. But then the next thing we looked at is if you take all these things away, if you stop smoking, stop eating late at night, stop chocolate, is there any evidence that your heartburn will get better? And the only thing we could find is that there was evidence that losing weight improved pH and improved symptoms, as, as we know. And there was also some evidence that elevating the head of the bed was useful. That's if you put a wedge under your bed. Uh, the A refers to randomized controlled trials. So you have a group that's you know, randomized to the intervention and another one that isn't. Um, and there's also some evidence that eating late, at, late meals at night was effective. But for all these other things, chocolate, spicy foods, orange juice, carbonated beverages, there's really been no evidence published. And, and my experience is, is most of my patients, I think, are able to take most of these substances and not really have an effect on their heartburn. So what I recommend, based on, these, on, this, on this paper where we compiled the data, is that if you feel like you have a certain substance that triggers your heartburn, like if you tell me every time you eat a taco you get heartburn, then I might tell you to avoid that or take a medication before you eat the taco. But otherwise, I think it's, it's reasonable to just to have a normal diet and not limit yourself severely based on this. And I'm actually trying to do a, ch a chocolate study next and get that funded, so uh, this will keep me busy for a while. I mentioned head of the bed elevation just to show you the data. If you use a wedge, which is sold commercially, or blocks and, and elevate the head of your bed, there is definitely evidence that that is effective. So I would recommend that. How do we diagnose heartburn? Well, one good way to diagnose heartburn is if you take a meprazole and you are relieved, your symptoms are relieved, then most likely you have heartburn. And that's called the omeprazole test. Now, uh, this is a slide looking at endoscopic classification. I just showed this in case any of you have had an endoscopy. There's different classifications that are used now. Uh, as I mentioned, most people will have a normal endoscopy because they're taking omeprazole or other medications, and that usually heals the erosions. Um, but for example, grade two esophagitis refers to erosions that are in the last part of the esophagus. Um, and then there's this LA grading, which you can see in some papers and literature that describe mucosal breaks and, and uh, the extent of them. So I just want to show you the different systems that are being used. Now, if you take a biopsy in somebody with heartburn, sometimes you'll see some changes. So you'll see that the, the basal layer here, which is the, the, the um, layer part of the esophageal lining, is thicker than usual. And these are called the papilla, and in heartburn they can be taller than normal. So you can actually see changes under the microscope in some patients who have normal endoscopies. Now the current test, particularly if you have a normal endoscopy, is to put a probe in so that you can measure your pH. And up until recently we were most commonly doing 24-hour pH monitoring. Here's a woman who has a probe in her nose, which is going down into her esophagus and stomach. And then, essentially, the probe is connected to a memory unit, and she wears this for 24 hours. We usually like to do this off of medication for a week, because if you're on medication, you may have a normal study. And you can see this doesn't look like too much fun. So uh, in 20 to 30% of the patients, you can actually have a, a false negative study, because sometimes patients don't feel like eating normally when they have the probe coming out of their nose. But we essentially tell patients to try to eat a normal diet and do the regular activities. And what you're seeing here is the, the lower dark line is actually the pH in the stomach, which in most normal people should be below 4 most of the time. And the top line is the pH in the esophagus. So every time that 
pH is dropping below 4, you're having heartburn. And during the study, we tell people to record their symptoms. So H is for heartburn, B is for belching, C is for chest pain. And if you push the button when the pH is dropping, that shows you're having good correlation with your symptoms. We're also measuring how much of the time the patient is upright versus lying down. And so you can see this is a person who's having frequent reflux, both during the daytime and also at night. Now, recently, there is wireless pH monitoring. It's also called the Bravo pH. And this is very convenient because you suction this probe into the esophagus, either during endoscopy or uh, the patient could just come in and, and be uh, unsedated and have this done. And this is very convenient because you can walk around. No one knows you're having this test done. You go home with a little data recorder. And this is actually a two-day test. So if I can get this done, I prefer to have this done because it'll give you more data over two days. And sometimes patients will have fluctuations. So one day will be normal, the other will be abnormal. What happens is that after about five to seven days, the capsule just falls off, and most patients don't see it. And um, then the, the data record is uploaded. This is what it looks like during endoscopy. We have a catheter, and here is the Bravo probe. And we essentially press a button or a, a plunger and apply suction. And then it's just very superficially suctioned to the esophagus and then just falls off. And we place it about six centimeters above where the junction is between the esophagus and the stomach. Now, more recently also, there's a technology called impedance, which is um, designed to measure other types of reflux and is inversely proportional to conductivity of um, uh, different substances. And the catheter looks the same as the pH monitoring catheter that we use. Um, so it measures regular pH. And then it also can tell you if people are having reflux that is non-acidic. So in other words, if you have somebody on medication, you want to know if they're still refluxing bile, for example, this will tell you uh, how much of that is coming up into the esophagus. And so essentially, this is a technology that's used for patients on medical therapy already to tell how many acid and non-acid reflux episodes they're having. And some surgeons are liking, like this now to determine if patients need surgery if, they're, if, they're medication, if their acid is not being controlled on medication. So this is what it looks like. If you're having a reflux event that's non-acidic, you kind of have a wave that goes up the esophagus of, of liquid coming up. Now, another test that we do commonly is called the motility test. And what this involves is putting a catheter down either the nose or the mouth for about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, the patient has to be awake. We have you swallow little sips of water every five minutes. And this test tells us different things. First of all, it tells us what the sphincter muscle looks like and what the pressure is like and whether it's behaving normally. So here's a person swallowing water. They have a nice peristaltic wave down the esophagus. And during that period of time, about five seconds while they're swallowing, the sphincter muscle is relaxing. And this is a normal type of a swallow. The amplitude is between 50 to 100 millimeters of mercury. And you can see it's, it's peristaltic. It's, it's starting at the top and progressing down in, in a nice fashion. What can happen in some patients with heartburn is you can get contractions that don't behave normally. Um, and you can actually have problems with the sphincter muscle. It can be either too low or not relaxing completely. So here's a, here's a patient with reflux disease. You can see that their contractions are very low amplitude. And this is a manifestation of having heartburn for many years, and the muscles are actually affected and get weak. Now, sometimes there are other things going on. This is why if you have heartburn and you get medication, you don't respond after a couple months. It's a good idea to do both the pH and the motility test to determine if you really have heartburn. Now, this is a condition called achalasia, which is commonly misdiagnosed in most patients for at least a year or two. What happens here is that the sphincter is hypertensive. It doesn't relax at all. And for reasons that are unclear, the, the nerve cells in that area just, just stop working. And so there's no relaxation. It's all just contraction. And so here's the sphincter not relaxing when the person swallows. And in the esophagus, you get dilation. And all the contractions are occurring at the same time. And this is a condition that can be treated by surgery, where the surgeon goes in and cuts the muscle. Or there's actually a balloon that you can use during endoscopy to, to tear the muscle. So this is a, a situation where patients may have heartburn, but they actually have a, a different condition going on. And then there's my favorite, which is called spasm or nutcracker esophagus. And patients will come in with either chest pain, trouble swallowing, or heartburn that just doesn't work, that doesn't respond to medication. Here's an x-ray showing kind of a corkscrew pattern. And when you do a motility study, you see a lot of very high amplitude contractions in the esophagus. Pressure is way over 200. 
that either are occurring all at the same time or in a peristaltic fashion. And this we can actually treat with medications like blood, pre blood pressure medications to relax the esophagus. Uh, some patients with this will also have heartburn and some will just have this alone. So it's important to do both tests and figure out how to treat it appropriately. So let me switch over now to medical treatment options. Uh, just to show you that heartburn is a chronic condition and most patients or a majority will actually relapse. In patients who have normal endoscopy over a six month period, the relapse rate can be anywhere between 20 and 40 percent. If you have severe erosions, you know, your likelihood of relapsing is, is much higher. And there are different medications uh, available. Um, just to point out that placebo, which is essentially a dummy drug, has been shown in most studies to have a response of about 20 to 40 percent. So that means that patients may just get better on their own. Um, the H2 blockers, which are drugs such as Tagamet or Zantac, are about 50% effective in relieving symptoms and healing erosions. And then the proton pump inhibitors, of which there are now uh, five or six on the market, there's Omeprazole, there's uh, Prevacid, there's Asafex, Protonix, Nexium, and Zegarid, they're all about 80-85% effective in, in relieving symptoms and also healing erosions. Now the question comes up about whether you need to take therapy every day if, if your doctor thinks you have heartburn. And there have been several studies showing that that's not necessarily the case. On-demand therapy is when you can just take medication if you have symptoms. And there have been several studies showing that if you take, um, this is in this case a meprazole, and you take it 20 milligrams whenever you have symptoms. So in this study, patients took on average about a pill every couple days. They had the same kind of symptom response as patients who took it every day. So I think that if you have heartburn, you can try to take medication as needed. If you obviously have symptoms every day, then you might need to take therapy on a regular basis. There's also something called intermittent therapy, which is where you take, let's say, a meprazole for two to six weeks at a time. And the thinking behind that is if you have erosion, that, that takes a certain amount of time to heal up. And there was a nice study done in England showing that in this large population, the majority of patients could stay off of their agents for about 142 days before they had to relapse. So I think both of those strategies are effective and you can experiment and, and see if that will work for you. Now there have been some concerns about long-term usage of these agents. Um, theoretically, you could have problems with absorption of vitamin B12, although none of us have really ever seen this clinically. Uh, there may be a risk of cancer um, or what's called atrophic gastritis, although there have been very large population studies now following patients for 20 to 30 years, really not demonstrating that any patients get cancer. So I, I don't think this is a major concern. There have been some studies linking these agents to pneumonia and also to certain infections such as a, a diarrheal state called Clostridium difficile infection. Um, these have in general been large database studies where there have been multiple risk factors identified and, and it turns out that these drugs are, are one of them. And then there was a recent study looking at hip fracture. Let me just show you that slide. Uh, this is actually where researchers from the University of Pennsylvania purchased a large database from England. And when they looked at multiple risk factors for hip fracture, they found that if you take more than two pills of a proton pump inhibitor per day, your risk of hip fracture was increased to 2.5 to 3 times uh, that of the person not taking these agents. There were other factors associated with hip fracture in the study, such as advancing age, alcohol usage, et cetera. And we do have some concerns about the study. We, do, we don't really know what the baseline bone density is in patients in England. Um, you know, these are mainly older patients. So, so probably what will happen is based on the study, we'll try to duplicate this in the United States and see if we find the same results. Uh, but in the meantime, obviously, if, if, if this is a concern, you can always take calcium every day and also have your bone density measured. Now, if you don't respond to agents like the proton pump inhibitors, there are drugs that we call prokinetics, which help the muscles contract more forcefully and force the acid out of the esophagus. Cisatri was a drug that everybody liked a lot. Unfortunately, it was taken off the market because it caused a, a, abnormal heart rhythms. And it's possible to get this, but you have to uh, have your physician sign a lot of paperwork and assume the risk if that happens. Uh, we also have a drug called metoclopramide or Reglin, which also works to push acid out of the system. And there's another drug called motilium or domperidone, which is not FDA approved in the United States, but can be obtained from Canada or Mexico, which works the same way. 
And the studies essentially show that if patients add on another agent, they may get about another 10% symptom relief. So, so if you're having symptoms that are not responding, and particularly if your muscles are weak, it may be useful to add on a drug like this. Uh, recently, I've been doing some work looking at a drug called baclofen, which has been used in spinal cord patients for spasticity, and it turns out that baclofen actually prevents the sphincter from relaxing, and in studies has actually shown to prevent the number of acid and non-acid uh, episodes. So there are companies now trying to develop long-acting versions of this drug that could be taken for reflux, and this would be very nice because it would be another way to treat reflux, another mechanism. Of, of working directly on the sphincter muscle and not on the acid secretion in the stomach. So uh, I, I found out in my search for images that there was a movie called Heartburn with uh, Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep. <laughs> a lot of pictures. Uh, now what do you do if you don't respond to therapy? Um, this is a slide showing that it's very important to take the drugs at the correct time. So the way that the proton pumps work is they go in and they turn off these pumps in the stomach that are secreting acid. And it's very important to take these drugs about an hour to a half an hour before you eat. Uh, that way they're starting to turn off the pumps. And then once you eat, those pumps are stimulated and they can be shut off more completely. So if you're taking the drug after meals or at bedtime before you go to sleep, it's probably not as effective. And quite often, once I tell my patients to do this, they'll get a response from the drug. The other thing is, is, do, is it really heartburn or not? And there's a lot of other things to think about. So for example, if you're taking a lot of pills, you can get inflammation in your esophagus from pills. The most common was Fosamax, which is used for osteoporosis, can give ulcers in the, in the esophagus. There's something called eosinophilic esophagitis, which is associated with allergies. Uh, you can see this in children, young adults. Um, we can uh, test patients for allergies and, and give them different medications for that. Infections are a concern, particularly in patients at risk, such as diabetics and patients that have transplants. Motility problems that I showed you. Now, if somebody has normal pH study and a normal motility study, they probably have what's called functional dyspepsia, which is kind of like irritable bowel syndrome of the stomach. And this is essentially a disorder where patients feel pain in their stomach, but don't really have abnormal amounts of acid. And we have different medications to treat that abnormality. So I think it's important at some point to figure out whether you just continue the medications or, or switch over to another one. And then there are some patients who have heartburn despite being on medication. Uh, this is a study that we published uh, recently where we took patients with heartburn and also Barrett's esophagus on therapy. So they were actually not having heartburn symptoms. And we found that about 50% of patients, despite being on medication, still had abnormal amounts of acid. And the question is, what do you do in this case? I think it depends on the situation. If, if someone has asthma or some other type of uh, problem where it's important to control the acid, then you might think about surgery or adding other medications. Now, as I mentioned, there's a, a certain subset of patients who have manifestations outside of the esophagus. So if you look at large population studies, most patients will not, but about 13% will have cough, 5% asthma, 14% chest pain, and then 10% will complain of laryngitis or cough or hoarseness. And unfortunately, this is a frustrating area for us because there are all, also many other causes, for example, of cough. So the most common is, let's say, postnasal drip from allergies, asthma, reflux is perhaps number third on the list, and then a, a variety of other causes. Uh, what's so frustrating about this is there have been a number of studies now where they actually place probes in patients and do randomized trials. And unfortunately, in this subset of patients, it's very difficult to show that the drug is actually working. So we found that even though these patients have reflux, if we treat them with these medications at very high doses, we don't really find necessarily that the patients respond. And I think that's because in these, in these extra esophageal manifestations, there's other causes as well. So the question always comes is, if someone comes to my clinic with bad heartburn who has a cough, should they go to surgery and will their cough go away? And at this point in time, I can't always guarantee that that will be the case. So this is an area where patients, people are doing more research to try to figure out how to solve. Uh, what about other ways to treat heartburn? Well, there have been a variety of, of uh, devices designed for heartburn, and I'll go over some of them with you. Um, Enterex was a product where you actually injected silicone in the area of the sphincter to make a ring, and the thought was that that might tighten up the sphincter area. Um, unfortunately, this was taken off the market last year because there were some deaths due to silicone being injected in the aorta, and um, it didn't really work. 
so uh, don't, don't go to a doctor for this. Um, Endosense is a device that is, is being worked on where you can go down with the scope and actually put sutures in into the sphincter area and try and tighten up. And this current device has not had tremendous success, but they are working now on deeper devices that can get sutures in deeper to see if they can actually have some success with that technique. A strata, which is also known as radio frequency, was a device that was developed where you put a catheter down into the esophagus and send out some needles that then send out radio frequency waves. And in dog studies, this actually showed, um, showed that you could cause some fibrosis or scarring in that, in that sphincter area and hopefully tighten it up. Um, a lot of the patients in these studies said that they felt better, but unfortunately when you put a pH probe down them, only 20% or so actually had normalization of their pH. So, and then they did a randomized study, and uh, again, the patient said that they felt better, but we were unable to show that patients really improved when we looked at the pressures and the pH in the majority of patients. So I think that there's more work trying to be done to devise endoscopic procedures, but currently uh, we can't really say that they will be that effective. And then there's the surgical procedure that I'll be showing you here. Uh, so as I mentioned here, in terms of the um, endoscopic therapies, um, they only really studied mild heartburn patients. Some of them were technically challenging and um, really were not that effective. Now the Nissen fundal application um, is a surgery where the surgeon goes in and takes the top of the stomach and wraps it around the bottom of the esophagus. And now this is actually able to be done laparoscopically. So the question is, should you have this done? Um, there have been studies showing that it is as effective as a medical therapy. Uh, the problem is that the wrap probably doesn't last forever. This is a study that was published where they took a VA cooperative group and half of them were randomized to medical therapy and the other half to surgical therapy. And then they had a private detector track all these people down after 10 years. And what they found was that after 10 years, about 92% of patients in the medical group were still taking medication, and 62% of patients who had surgery were back on their medication. So I think over time, the wrap loosens in a lot of patients and probably will not be effective more than about 10 years. They also found that there was an excessive rate of heart death or cardiac death in the surgical group uh, for unclear reasons, and they didn't find any difference in the rate of cancer. So I think if you were gonna go for surgery, um, the reasons to do that are perhaps to get off medication, or if you have asthma that's very difficult to control, that may be a good reason. Um, the other thing about surgery is about 30% of patients after surgery will have problems swallowing because you're tightening the area up of the sphincter, and also more problems with gas and bloating. So you may trade your heartburn for some other symptoms that may not be so, uh, so worthwhile having. So nowadays, we, we usually don't send most patients for surgery and, and you know, try to weigh the decisions. Um, now, Barrett's esophagus is the next thing I'll be talking about. This is a precancerous condition. This is a patient who has the junction between the esophagus and the stomach, as you can see here. And above that area, you can see this abnormal red-looking tissue, which should not be there. If you biopsy that tissue, you can see cells that look like the small intestine. And that's a condition we call Barrett's. How do you determine that Barrett's esophagus is present? And I, I would say I get one to two cases a week in my clinic of people coming in with reports that, that say that they have Barrett's and then I have to try to figure out if they have it. But the endoscopist really needs to tell the patient and, and on the report, they need to determine where the stomach folds end. And then in order to diagnose Barrett's, there needs to be abnormal tissue that extends up into the esophagus that's at least five millimeters or greater in length. And again, when you biopsy it, you have to see typical changes of small intestine. So, you know, if the endoscopy doesn't have those kind of information in, in the report, it's sometimes difficult to tell whether you have it or not. Now, the thought is that in some patients who get esophagitis, they have erosions. In the healing process, the lining of the esophagus changes to this abnormal type of tissue, which looks like small intestine. So it's it's thought that in a small subset of patients after an episode of erosions, then they heal and then they get this abnormal tissue. Uh, short Barrett's is when you have tongues that are three centimeters or less, and a long Barrett's would be if it's greater than three centimeters and extends up the esophagus. And so in these patients who develop Barrett's esophagus, the risk of cancer is about half a percent a year, which is fairly low. Um, 
If you progress to what's called dysplasia, where you have more abnormal cells, your risk is about 5% a year. And then of those patients, uh, so I said a small subset can actually progress to cancer. So in the majority of patients, when we find the Barrett's, they usually do not have any advanced precancerous changes. And the question is really, how do you manage patients? The current recommendations is if you have Barrett's, you probably should have an endoscopy every three years to recheck the area. If you have high-grade dysplasia, we would manage you more aggressively and check you every three months and perhaps operate or do other things that I'll be showing you in a little bit. So this is a study from Sweden where, uh, in terms of risk factors for cancer, they found that it was, the risk was increased if patients had frequent heartburn, nighttime symptoms, and, and more long-standing heartburn. Um, the thing about the study that was alarming is that 40% of patients who had cancer denied any previous heartburn. And I did a study a couple of years ago where I actually performed endoscopy at the VA hospital on patients undergoing colon cancer screening, and I found that 25% of patients who had no symptoms had Barrett's esophagus. So I think that it is also possible for people not to know they're having heartburn and, and have this detected. Now, for reasons that are unclear, the incidence of cancer of the esophagus has been rising very quickly since the 1970s, apparently faster than any other cancer. So if you look at the, at the number of cancers in, in the United States, it's still number 10 on the cancer list. It, it's not that common of a cancer, but it appears to be increasing in frequency, and that may be related to uh, the obesity epidemic in this country. So the big question is, do you care about Barrett's and should you screen? And every year we have debates, and it's still being debated. Um, why should you screen? Well, the reason you should screen is that it's thought that pretty much all cancers arise from Barrett's esophagus. So if you have Barrett's esophagus and you follow it, then you can prevent the cancer or you can find it at an early stage. And this is, these are studies, um, uh, actually, this study actually shows though that most patients coming in with cancer have never been diagnosed with Barrett's. So the thinking is if you've screened everybody and found it, perhaps you could prevent the cancer. The people on the other side of the fence say, well, most patients probably will die of other causes and are older patients. Um, therefore, if you do all this screening, you're just going to run up the, the bill, health care bill in the United States and probably won't impact most patients' life expectancy. Um, there is some data, however, from multiple studies showing that if you put patients in a Barrett surveillance program, you will find cancers earlier, and those patients do a lot better in terms of survival compared to patients who have not, not been in a, in a program. So in patients who never were in a Barrett's program, the survival um, rate is about 20% compared to anywhere between 70 to 90% in patients in a, in a program. Now, the, the new trend now is to try to figure out, is there some way to risk stratify patients? And we're now looking at molecular markers. There's something called flow cytometry, which is when you take a piece of tissue from Barrett's and actually look under the microscope and look at the DNA content. And if you have abnormalities in what's called flow cytometry, we've actually found that your cancer incidence is much higher compared to patients who don't have these abnormalities. The, this kind of leader in this field is the um, Seattle um, group who does a lot of work, and they actually have a laboratory that does these flow cytometry studies. I'm probably going to be starting a, a study in a registry here at Stanford where I'll be taking tissue and sending it to Seattle uh, for patients. But I, I think this will be very useful because if you have a normal test, we can probably reassure you that your risk of cancer is quite low over the next five years, and, and perhaps just focus our attention in patients who have abnormal studies. They've also looked at other markers. This is called the P53 mutation, which is another gene, and this, again, nicely shows that in patients who have the abnormality found, the risk of cancer over six years is markedly increased compared to patients without those markers. So perhaps eventually we'll have some type of a genetic panel we can do to figure out who's really at high risk and who isn't. Now, what do you do if you have abnormal cells? Well, one option is to come in more frequently and have your endoscopist take many biopsies. There is good data showing that if you biopsy every one centimeter in the segment of Barrett's at four quadrants so all the way around, you have a higher chance of picking up uh, uh, cancer cells. There's also new endoscopes being developed now that have magnification capabilities and we can inject dye and do different things to try to pick up our, our uh, rate of dysplasia. The other option is you can actually go for an operation and have an esophagectomy. Um, there's also endoscopic options that I'll be talking about. One of the biggest problems that it's hard to find pathologists to actually agree about whether you have abnormal cells and how advanced they are. So if you look at different pathologists, a lot of times there'll be disagreement 
which is why I think the molecular markers would help us more accurately figure out the cancer risk. And also, and this is probably related to markers, if you look at series of patients with what's called high-grade dysplasia, you can see that the risk of can developing cancer is anywhere from 15% all the way up to 85%, depending on what center you're looking at. So it's, it's not a disease progression that we understand very well at this point. Now, should you go for an operation? Well, the statistics are that if you have your esophagus taken out that's involved, about 30% of the time you might have cancer found. Um, however, these statistics are from older studies where the endoscopists weren't necessarily taking a lot of tissue biopsies. So hopefully this number is decreasing. The problem is this is quite a severe operation with a post-operative mortality rate of about 15%, and a lot of patients are not surgical candidates because they have other heart and lung problems. So you really have to decide whether you want to have this operation done. Quite often after the operation, patients will have trouble swallowing for about a year, and, and it, it's quite an extensive operation to undergo, but it does cure you of cancer. Uh, more recently, there are endoscopic techniques that have been developed. This is called mucosal resection, where you actually inject under the area initially and then take a snare and can actually snare off large areas of tissue. This allows you to get better sampling of tissue to have a more accurate diagnosis and has been shown to be safe. Um, this is a study from Wiesbaden in Germany where they were quite advanced and they took uh, about 300 patients who had high-grade dysplasia or early cancer and you can see here they essentially snare off large amounts of tissue and found that um, most of the patients actually were in remission and did very well in terms of long-term survival with, with no deaths and small amounts of complications. So more and more endoscopists in the United States are being trained to do these advanced techniques to avoid the surgery. Uh, this is a study that was just presented a couple weeks ago um, where they, in Amsterdam, resected areas of tissue and then used a, a radio frequency device called the HALO system which can actually ablate other areas that are left over. And they actually found, and these are small numbers of patients, but they found that most of these patients were uh, cancer-free um, when they followed them for about a year. So in summary, uh, heartburn is a chronic condition that can affect quality of life. Uh, there's a strong link between being overweight and having heartburn and all the complications of heartburn. Um, if you're not responding to typical medication, you should probably undergo further testing to figure out if you really have heartburn or the other conditions that I, I mentioned. Uh, patients who have chronic heartburn probably should have an endoscopy at some point to look for Barrett's esophagus if you believe it's worthwhile looking for that. So if, if you're an older patient with multiple medical problems, you know, you may decide not to do this, but in general, we do recommend it after several years of symptoms. And in the future, I think that we'll be doing more work with, with molecular markers to figure out how to manage patients in whom we determine that they have Barrett's esophagus. Uh, medical and surgical therapy are probably equally efficacious for heartburn symptoms, but in the majority of patients now, we try to me medically manage them. Um, and now, as I showed, there's endoscopic techniques which may be as effective as surgery for treatment of patients who have dysplasia and early cancer that's not advanced uh, associated with Barrett's esophagus. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So the question is whether you have reflux, whether you should take um, digestive enzymes, and whether your acid levels are normal. I think the answer to the question is that most patients with heartburn are producing normal amounts of acid, but the reason they're having heartburn is that their sphincter muscle is relaxing too much and so that the acid is coming up into the esophagus from the stomach where it shouldn't be. So, so the answer to the question is that not that you're producing too much acid, it's just that the acid is behaving in a fashion that it shouldn't be. And, and the most likely reason is that either the stomach is not emptying correctly because you're eating fatty meals or eating late at night and so things back up, or the sphincter is relaxing too often. Um, I don't have any good evidence that taking digestive enzymes will help with heartburn. So Prilosec is one of the proton pump inhibitors. That I, that I showed, um, there's actually six on the market, and Prilosec is over the counter, as you know. And so what Prilosec does is that it actually uh, binds to those pumps in the stomach and, and turns off the pumps, so it prevents the pumps from secreting acid. Not 100%, but in most patients, it will, it will decrease the acid production about 40 to 50% or so. And so what happens is when you take a Prilosec, your acid production in the stomach is, is decreased, and therefore less will come up into the esophagus. So that's essentially how it works.
So when you look at the other drugs, so compared to, so for example, if you look at Tums or Mylanta, those are, those are very effective because they neutralize the acid, but the problem is they only work for about 30 to 40 minutes. They're not long acting. So you have to either take 10 Tums a day, which, and the problem with Tums is it has calcium, which can constipate you, and things like Mylanta have magnesium, which can cause diarrhea. So they're effective, they're effective quickly, perhaps more quickly than the proton pump inhibitors, but they don't last as long. And then the other agents like the Zantac, uh, Tagamet, are about 50% effective, but the proton pump inhibitors are the most effective currently of the drugs that we have. And they're about 70 to 80% effective in terms of healing and also symptoms. Now there is a drug that was uh, relatively new on the market called Zegarid, which is an omeprazole plus a sodium bicarbonate. So the thought there is that if you take that drug, the sodium bicarbonate will act right away, and then the omeprazole will, will act later. Um, so that might give you more immediate symptom relief compared to the other ones. I, I don't think, I mean, there have been now long-term studies published, mainly in the UK, looking at people on PPIs for 20 to 30 years. They didn't find any cancer. Uh, as I mentioned, there was this hip fracture study that just came out this year that's getting a lot of press. Again, that was data from England, so we need to show that that's the same case in the United States. Um, the other things I really am not worried about, we don't really see clinically. So I, I don't think it's a major concern. Uh, the, I think the safety profile is quite good if you take it long term. Um, the other thing, as I showed, is you can try to take it as needed, and if that works, that would be another way to manage the symptoms. So um, he, the, patient, uh, the gentleman here said he was diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus and, and uh, recently was told to take the proton pump inhibitor twice a day. Barrett's esophagus, there have been some studies in a laboratory showing that if your acid is not well controlled, that may increase your risk of getting cancer or precancerous condition um, or more advanced cells like dysplasia. So in patients with Barrett's esophagus, it is a good idea to try to com you know, completely control the acid. Um, what's interesting is for some reason, the Barrett's esophagus qu patients quite often don't complain of symptoms that are severe compared to the regular heartburn patients. But what we do quite often is we will do a pH study on medication to make sure it's being suppressed. And then if it isn't, we can try to keep increasing the therapy until the, the acid profiles are suppressed. That's mainly based on laboratory data. It, see, the problem is that the, the um, number of patients who have dysplasia or cancer is so small that it's very difficult to do studies to show that you're actually impacting that outcome. You have to have thousands and thousands of studies. But I, I think that's one situation where it's a good idea to be more aggressive because of the theoretical risk of cancer. So the question is, if you cut down on your stomach acidity, will you have other side effects? Um, currently, there, there's no evidence really that you'll get any other type of problems like infections. But there have been some of these population studies that perhaps are suggesting that patients that have um, certain diarrheal states and pneumonia, you know, may be related to those drugs. Um, but again, those are patients who may also have other risk factors for that. So, so we don't see that in the majority of patients. So I, I can't really say that there's been a problem demonstrated with, let's say, vitamin absorption or other problems from taking these drugs. Uh, so this gentleman asked about H. pylori treatment and why you need a proton pump inhibitor to treat the infection. Is that what you're asking about? Let me just um, first talk about H. pylori. That there's um, been a debate going on about whether H. pylori bacteria is related to reflux disease. And there's been a number of studies showing that even if you treat H. pylori, you probably don't have much impact on, on heartburn. So some patients think if you treat H. pylori, maybe the heartburn will go away, but that has not been the case. So there's a definite link between the H. pylori infection and stomach cancer. So I think that's appropriate, especially if you have a family history of cancer to have screening. Uh, whether you need to eat more food if you're on proton pump inhibitors um, has not been shown to be the case. I mean, basically the, the proton pump inhibitors do inhibit your acid, but not completely. So you do have enough still to digest food normally. Um, why you need to take, so when you get H. pylori infection, typically we recommend two or three antibiotics plus the proton pump inhibitor. Um, why that is the case, um, I mean, in general, the H. pylori will, will be suppressing the acid in the stomach. Um, it, it turns out that it's a, it's a quite difficult bacteria to kill, and, and you need a combination of drugs um, along with the acid suppression to get, to get rid of it. And that was basically determined, you know, using culture studies and that kind of thing. So, but, but um, uh, whether these drugs change the amount or the frequency that you have to eat is, has not been shown. So if you have Barrett's esophagus, again, there's no evidence that you need to avoid any foods. Um, I think the major thing is making sure that your acid is being controlled adequately. And, um, but I don't have any evidence that changing your diet, even if you have heartburn, will help. 
So I, I think it's, you know, if you're overweight, it probably helps to lose weight, not to eat late at night. But the type of food you eat, it probably doesn't matter. And there's really been no study showing a link between certain types of food that you eat and progression to cancer. So um, again, there have been long-term studies looking at all these proton pump inhibitors showing that over 20 to 30 years they're, they're safe. Um, there's this theoretical risk of cancer, but no one's ever been able to show that people get stomach cancer related to these. Now, in terms of the different drugs, um, there was a recent study looking at all the different proton pump inhibitors, and they did show if you have severe erosive disease that Nexium is probably better in terms of healing that. But for all the other patients, they show that they're pretty much similar. So quite often, I guess I ask the question, you know, which proton pump inhibitor is the best? And unfortunately, you don't really have much of a choice. It really depends on your insurance company. And I get so tired of arguing with these companies. But I think that essentially they're all about the same. You know, very rarely patients will have some side effects. So for example, Lansoprasol, which is prevacid, can sometimes cause more diarrhea than the others. But, but for most patients, I think they're all about the same in terms of safety profile and also efficacy. Uh, the, the one exception to that is if you have continued erosions and really severe disease where, where Nexium is probably superior. That's an interesting question. So the question is if you have gallbladder surgery, might you have an increased risk of heartburn afterwards? And the, and the thinking is once you take the gallbladder out, you might have more bile coming up from your system, which might lead to more reflux. Um, we did do a study and couldn't really necessarily find that that was the case. But I, I suppose it is possible because you're altering the bile flow that there, that there may be a relationship. And one way to test that would be that impedance that I showed you, which could directly measure bowel reflux. However, most centers are not actually doing that at this point. It's mainly in, in research settings. Well, Fosamax can be a problem if you're taking it and kind of going to bed right away, and you know, there's been described ulcers of the esophagus. If you're taking the pill and walking around and you have normal motility, there shouldn't really be a problem. But if, if you had heartburn and then took Fosamax and found that your symptoms were much worse, it could be related to ulcers. Now that's a true also for any large pills. So if you took a large tetracycline pill or some other major pill, and particularly if your motility is not normal, um, then you might have ulcers from the medications. So when we talk about pill-induced esophagitis, usually we find it in the top of the esophagus because it's in patients who have problems with their muscles working correctly and the pills get lodged there and that's where the ulcers form. And, and it's been more described usually in older patients that have motility that's been impaired and they take their pills and go right to sleep and the pills just kind of sit there. So if a patient comes in with, let's say, laryngitis or cough, um, we usually recommend, you know, first that they go to an ENT doctor to take a look down the vocal cords, make sure there's no cancer. The, the biggest problem is this red vocal cord business, which, which we see all the time. They send them to me, they say that the person must have reflux, and then we put them on reflux medication, they don't get any better. I think it's important to look at other potential causes, so allergies, sinus infections, perhaps get a sinus x-ray. And then we can do pH monitoring, and if there is reflux, quite often they'll give patients you know, very high doses of Nexium to try to control it. Um, but I can't always guarantee that that will get better. What I'll do these days, though, is I'll, I'll start the PPI, and then I'll repeat the pH probe on medication. And if it looks like the acid is being suppressed, but you still have hoarseness, then I can say, well, probably the hoarseness at this point is not due to acid reflux. So it's probably a factor, but what we get frustrated is a lot of times, even though we treat patients very aggressively with these agents, the symptoms still don't go away. So I think there may be other factors than just the reflux alone. Can acupuncture and Chinese herbs help? Uh, well, as I showed you in one of the slides, there is what's called a placebo response of about 20 to 30 percent. Um, so that means that in some patients who don't get any treatment or get sort of the dummy arm of a study, there is a certain response. And I think that's because heartburn can kind of come and go in a lot of patients. And I don't know of any mechanism or evidence that acupuncture will necessarily help um, in terms of acid. But um, so, so, so I, my answer, I guess, is I don't have any evidence that it will, it will necessarily help in heartburn. It, it hasn't been proven. But, but people have known to been, you know, respond to lots of different things. So it's possible that the heartburn just might go away for, for other reasons that we don't understand. So the question is, if you get regurgitation, what do you do? Um, milk is, is, when you ask patients a lot of times in the middle of the night, they'll go down to the refrigerator and get some milk. I think it's because it neutralizes the acid. Uh, the thing that will work the fastest is probably to take something like Tums or Mylanta. That will work the quickest. Um, if it's happening at night, I would try to make sure that you're not eating before going to bed.
And, you know, most of these drugs that I show here should help with regurgitation as well. But if you're having regurgitation that's really not going away, it's probably worthwhile doing some of these other studies to make sure that it's heartburn and also to look at the muscle function. And in those kind of cases, you might want to take a drug that actually helps the muscles work more forcefully, the peristaltic drug, to try to force the acid out of the system. So in, in, in those cases, it may just be more than one drug that's needed. Yeah, the question is if you can't breathe, is there, is there a relationship? Um, there have been relationships now with people who have sleep apnea who wake up suddenly at night and, and reflux disease. Um, so it, if, if you can't breathe and it's happening more frequently, I mean, I would first get a lung evaluation and make sure there's no asthma or lung kind of problems, have lung testing performed. But it, it, it is not unreasonable to have a pH study, for example, to see what's going on um, and if there is reflux present. So the only way to really tell if it's related would be to put a probe down and, and measure the acid directly. But there hasn't been a relationship between breathing problems and reflux. So the question is, what's waking patients up? I mean, it's a great question. The way to really tell, I think, is to have uh, a pH probe put in. And if you're having a lot of acid at night, you can see, you know, the pH is dropping. And it's been, it's been well shown that patients that have pH dropping below 4 for more than an hour at night definitely have more severe reflux. They're the ones that have the erosions, they can have Barrett's esophagus. So um, patients that have nighttime reflux have more severe disease. And uh, the, the pH monitoring can be very useful to tell when you're waking up. Even if you don't feel symptoms, we can try to tell at that period of time whether the pH is dropping. That would probably be the best way to tell. The question is whether the sputum can tell you. I mean, in general, patients will complain more of a bitter reflux coming up. So sputum is probably not related to reflux, is what I would guess. It's more of the acid. But, you know, it's hard to tell if you're asleep what's waking you up because you're, you're half out of it. So uh, sometimes it's very difficult to tell. The preceding program was brought to you by Stanford on iTunes U and is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at itunes.stanford.edu.